Lab 5, Microscopic Observation of Cells by Emma and Navi. Let's start off with some basic history of the microscope. The first compound microscope was invented in 1595 by Zacharias Janssen of Holland, and in 1665 Robert Hooke studied cork under a primitive homemade compound microscope. He coined the word cell from Latin roots, which means small compartment, in order to describe the structures that he observed. And in 1675, Anton van Leeuwenhoek observed single-celled microorganisms such as bacteria. In order to get an idea of what early microscopes looked like, here is uh, some visual representations of what they probably looked like. So we can see that in 1595, the microscope kind of looked like a telescope. Uh, and it slowly evolved to look a bit more complicated and more complicated as the years passed. Here's a quick introduction to current day mic microscopy, and here is a photo of a compound microscope sim similar to the ones that we used in class. And a microscope is a magnification tool that allows us to study the structure and function of cells. And Microscopes in cover three important parameters, such as res resolution, which me measures the clarity of an, of an image, contrast, which shows the difference in lightness, darkness, or color between adjacent regions in a sample, and magnification, which is basically the ratio between the size of an image produced by a microscope and its actual size. There are two main types of microscopes. The first, a light microscope, which uses light for illumination, and it has a resolution of 0.2 micrometers. And the second type of microscope is an electron microscope, which uses an electron beam for illumination. And it has a resolution of up to 2 nanometers, which is nearly 100 times stronger than the light microscope. And there's two types of electron microscopes, the first being a scanning electron microscope, which is a sample coated in, in which um, a sample is coated with a heavy metal, and then electron beams scan the surface in order to create a 3D image of it. And scanning electron microscopes allow us to see the external organization or see the surface of a sample, while on the other hand, transmission electron microscopes allow us to see the internal organization of a structure or see within a sample. But in order for that to happen, the specimen must be dead. And they also have to be thinly sliced and stained with heavy metals. And in order for this to happen, an electron beam is transmitted through the sample. Here are the images of a light microscope, scanning electron microscope, and transmission electron microscope. So you can just get a grasp and see how much more powerful the electron microscopes are than the light microscope because the light microscope you can have on a table those are the ones we use in lab but on the other hand scanning and transmission electron microscopes take up nearly an entire room and are very powerful and can allow us to see things on a much much smaller level when using a microscope it's very important to know how to focus it correctly in order to observe your specimen to the best of your ability so these are the steps that we used in order to focus our microscope. So first we began with the objective lens um, with the lowest magnification, which is called the scanning objective, and we turned the re revolving nose piece until this objective's objective lens was over the stage. And then we used the coarse adjustment knob to move the stage so that it was close to the lens. Then we placed whatever slide we were observing on the stage and secured it with the stage clips. And while we were looking through the ocular lens, we slowly moved the stage away from the lens in order, with the course adjustment knob in order to clearly focus the sample. And once we got it focused using the course adjustment knob, we rotated the revolving nose piece to the next objective lens, and then we used the fine adjustment knob to, sharp, to sharpen the focus of the image. And in, we did this because as we move up in magnification, we won't be able to use the course adjustment knob because it will move the stage too much, which can result in the long objective lens cracking the slide. So we use the fine adjustment knob, which moves the stage at a much smaller rate in order to get the precise image that we want to see. 
And so once we focused on the low power objective lens, we then turned the revolving nose piece to the next objective lens, the high power, and we observed it from there. Now here is some basic background of cells that are very crucial to life. Uh, cell theory, which was discovered by Robert Hooke, says that all living organisms are composed of one or more cells, cells are the smallest units of life, and that new cells come only from pre-existing cells by cell division. And there's two types of cells, and they're broken into prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which we will see in the upcoming slides. So the first category of cells, prokaryotes. They are simple cell structures, and they lack a membrane enclosed nucleus, which results in them having only a nucleoid region. And they also contain ribosomes that float freely in their cytoplasm, and their plasma membrane encloses the cytoplasm. They also secrete glycocalyx, which prevents destruction, which prevents their destruction from a host, and it also aids in water absorption. And prokaryotes also contain a cell wall, which is filled with carbohydrates along and peptides. And they also contain appendages such as pili for attachment and flagella, which allows uh, prokaryotes to move and provides them with locomotion. The second type of cells are eukaryotes. They are much, much larger and more complex than prokaryotes, which means they are multicellular. Their shape, size, and organization vary greatly among themselves, so eukaryotic cells can differ greatly between the same species or even the same cell type. They are not the same. Eukaryotes contain DNA inside of their nucleus, so they do not have a nuclear region, they have a nucleus. And they exhibit compartmentalization, and they have membrane-bound organelles. So unlike prokaryotes, eukaryotes contain many, many organelles, such as mitochondria and the cytoskeleton. They also contain rough ER, smooth ER. They contain proxosomes, lysosomes, many, many other organelles that prokaryotes live without. And eukaryotes also contain, well, some eukaryotes also contain cell walls, vacuoles, and chloroplasts. And an example of this type of eukaryote would be a plant cell. Plant cells do contain cell walls, and they have chloroplasts along with vacuoles. However, animal cells do not. Moving on to the six kingdoms of life. They are organized as bacteria, archaea, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. And as we can see in this graphic representation, um, bacteria and archaea are also called eubacteria and archaebacteria, and those are both interchangeable. Firstly, let's discuss bacteria. They are prokaryotes and they are unicellular, and they are the most abundant prokaryotes, and they are found nearly everywhere. They reproduce asexually via binary fission, which means that they grow to a fixed size and then split into two. In order to metabolize, they have two types. The first type is an autotroph, which means that they produce organic compounds from inorganic sources, such as cyanobacteria. And the second type is heterotrophs, which means that they produce organic compounds by, by obtaining organic food from other organisms. And an example of a heterotroph would be a chloroflexi, which you can see in the table. Some pathogenic bacteria can cause human death, disease, and infections. And some examples of this are tetanus, syphilis, cholera, and tuberculosis. However, only a small percentage of bacteria are pathogenic. Most bacteria are do not cause destruction and they are needed and essential for life. So for example, in humans, bacteria are found in our digestive tract and aid the breakdown of carbohydrates. So bacteria for this purpose are essential to humans. E. coli 
can produce vitamin K and prevents the establishment of pathogenic bacteria within the intestine. The first type of bacteria that we observed was Bacillus subtilis, and it contains a rod, it is rod shaped and cylindrical. And we can see here it at a thousand times magnification. Uh, the second type of bacteria we observed was called Cocos, and it is symmetri symmetrically spherical bacteria, and we can see it here at 400 times magnification. We also observed Spirillium, which is a spiral, sh which is spiral shaped with one or more twists, and it's also helical. It's a helical type of bacteria, and we can see it here at a thousand times magnification. We also observed Staphylococcus aureus, which is a spherical and symmetrical type of bacteria. And the reason it is called Staphylo, or it has that prefix, is because that defines bacteria that are clustered. And here we can see it at a thousand times magnification. Here we can see the Staphylococcus aureus sample live, and we can still see it has its spherical and clustered shape at 40 times magnification. Now moving on to the second kingdom, Archaea. They are prokaryotes and are unicellular, and they are found in extreme environments, which means that they can be found in environments with very high salt content, acidity, methane levels, or temperatures. For example, they can be found in hot springs or salt lakes. They also reproduce asexually through binary fission, just like those of bacteria. And they are autotrophs and heterotrophs, which means that their energy can be derived from hydrogen gas, CO2, sulfur, as well as sunlight. Now, an example of archaea are methanogens, which can convert CO2, methyl groups, or acetate to methane and release it from their cells. So the reason this is very important is because methanogens ultimately maintain the Earth's levels of methane. And another example of archaea is something called Methanobrevibacter smithi, which is found in the human gut. And this is essential for humans because it's essential for our digestion of polysaccharides. And this type of archaea also removes excess hydrogen in order to increase the transformation of, nutri of nutrients into calories. And over here, we can see a microscopic photo of methanogen. Moving on to the third kingdom, Protista. They are eukaryotes and are unicellular, and they are abundant in moist habitats, such as oceans, lakes, wetlands, rivers. They reproduce asexually and sexually and they consist of organotrophs and autotrophs, which means that their energy energy is derived through organic materials and sunlight. And these specifically are called photoautotrophs. Photosynthetic pro protists, also called algae, generate at least half of the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. And this is very, very important for us humans because we obviously need oxygen to breathe. And algae also produces organic compounds that feed marine and freshwater animals, and algae is used to make oil. Protist pathogens such as Plasmodium falciparum cause malaria in humans, which is transferred around through a female mosquito. And he, over on the right, we can see a microscopic picture of Plasmodium falciparum and algae.